Hey guys, it's been a while. Um, I made this project and I hope this video will help someone else do something similar. So this is a programmable remote control. Um, I know it looks interesting, but it does work. So the story behind this is I recently moved and I misplaced my Roku remote control. And I live in a little more remote place, so it takes six days for Amazon to deliver. And I thought this would be an interesting project. So I started doing some digging. Turns out there's this whole community around this one kind of programmable universal remote. It's a universal remote that you can actually plug your computer into and program. And you, and you can't just plug it in and then drag and drop. It's not that easy, but it is doable. And they've written some software to do it. And the coolest thing is they've documented like every remote control protocol on the planet. So there were actually two or three people that had documented how to remote control the Roku. Turns out the Roku uses a protocol called NEC. It's an insanely um, simple yet common protocol. Essentially, this is the way the protocol works. First, it's a 38 kilohertz infrared transmitter and receiver. Um, it transmits like a nine millisecond pulse and then four milliseconds off. And then it sends two bytes, or, or four bytes, I'm sorry, really simply. The first byte is the device ID. The second byte is the sub-device ID. The third byte is the command. And the fourth byte is the inverse of the command. So all the ones become zeros, zeros become ones. Um, anyway, so what I did is I went to the store and I bought this generic, uh, it was from the thrift store. It was just some random remote control. Um, because I wanted to use this uh, Raspberry Pi Pico, the RP2040 chip with MicroPython. Um, and this chip can only drive about 20 milliamps per I.O. pin. And to drive the infrared transmitter and make it have decent range, you really need more than that. So if you look on this board really close, you can see that chip right there. And that's a very common IC for driving uh, remote controls, which we're not using at all. And then if you look between these wires, you'll see that one little bitty transistor. Can you see it there? Yep, that transistor. And then there's a resistor right there that actually leads to the transistor. Uh, and I don't know if that's a MOSFET or a transistor or whatever. It is MPN because it's switching the uh, negative side and not the positive side. Um, so an N-type MOSFET, or I think an MPN transistor, I could be wrong. Anyways, so I hijacked that by just soldering a little lead right there. I cut the trace that went to the microchip. Um, it's got an independent power supply, so I pulled out a capacitor right here. Um, there's a capacitor there, and uh, which it probably needs, but it works okay without it. I soldered in these leads, had a double A pack that would clip right there, so it has power. And then I didn't have, I didn't want to do a ton of soldering with a bunch of buttons, so I had this joystick from one of the Freenove uh, microcontroller kits. Freenove makes all kinds of like hobbyist kits that come with tons of peripherals. They're really cool. That's where I got both the battery pack and this. I wired this up and then I wrote some MicroPython code so that the different corners do different functions and then the left, right, up, down, and the click. So click and up is power on and power off. Left and right is left and right. Up and down is up and down. Center click is center click, just on the Roku remote. Upper left is volume down, upper right is volume up, this is back, and that's menu. And we used this for like three days till the Roku remote arrived, and it works great. Honestly, I was really surprised this project was a success. I didn't think I'd be able to find the information, and I didn't think I would actually have the skills to pull it off, but I did. Really surprising. So now I'm working on another one. Uh, it's much more sophisticated. It's here on my desk, and my goal is actually to um, keep all the factory buttons but replace the IC with an ESP32. Um, this guy, I also didn't do power saving, so you gotta change the batteries every couple of days, but I use rechargeables for everything, so it wasn't a big deal for three days. Um, but by putting the device to sleep and using wake interrupts and all that fun stuff, you can make it just like these that last forever. So um, anyway, so that's the next fun project, Go Controls. Uh, real quick, I wanna take you through the code, so let's do that now. So here we go. Um, now, granted, this project wasn't as simple as I thought. It did require some equipment. I had to use my oscilloscope to verify the 38 kilohertz wave was coming out right. Uh, but let's just rip through it. Just two imports. I used Thawney. If you haven't used Thawney for MicroPython, it's freaking awesome when you're starting out because you get a um, an interface. It's called REPL, but for those that don't know it, it's kind of like GW Basic way back in the day where you could write commands and they would actually execute immediately. Um, or DOS, Linux, whatever. It's not a full-featured OS necessarily, but it is MicroPython, and you can type and use it. So I highly recommend it. Um, anyway, so import machine, import time. I create a pin, pin one. 
Um, it's a PWM pen or PWM capable. I set the duty cycle to 32,000, which is 50-50, and then I set the frequency to 38 kilohertz. Um, now, the reason I needed the oscilloscope was that when I first did this, I wasn't getting a good waveform out, um, and it turned out it was a power problem, so I had to, it couldn't, the Raspberry Pi Pico could not provide enough current from the USB port over three volts to drive the LED. So that's when I discovered I needed that separate power supply. And, you know, I was just hoping it would work, but good thing I checked it out. Uh, blue pen, there is an LED on the uh, Pi Pico that I'm using, and this is the blue pen for it. Um, and then these are the command bytes for the remote control protocol for the Roku. And Roku I think it's the same for Roku and Roku TVs, and it's just the sub-device ID that changes, but don't quote me on that. So volume down, volume up, power, left, right, up, down, okay, back and home. I created this class called NEC, super simple. You pass the device ID, the sub-device ID when you create it. It has its own delay, because here was a problem, I was using sleep, and you can't use sleep, because sleep will turn off the 38 kilohertz um, PWM signal that drives the infrared LED. So instead, you have to pause, which is where I use right here, this pass. Um, the timing isn't great. It's off by as much as like 20%, but the protocol still works. So um, send signal start. This is the 9 millisecond high, 4,500 millisecond low. And then if you want to send a zero because you're sending bits, you send a high of 562 milliseconds followed by a low of 563. And on mine, it's coming out as like 620 or something milliseconds, or microseconds, works fine. So to send a one bit, you send the same high, but then you do a pause that's three times as long. That's why the timing is not as critical, at least for my device. So send control, I have it send the start signal, which we just went over, send a byte. And if we look at sending byte, essentially all we're doing is we are getting the bit by anding the data that we want to send with one. If it's zero, we send zero. If it's not, we send not. And then we do a bit shift, I think to the right. I don't know, right, left, whatever. Bit shift to the right. It brings the next bit in. Um, and then we have send pulses and stop pulses. This is just how we tell it, send, stop. So when we send a one, we send pulses, and then we stop, and then we start the next byte. So. Pretty, pretty, I mean, it's like kind of a nice class. So, and I put this up on GitHub somewhere. Um, so then right here, I create the new NEC instance of the class, the device ID and sub-device ID. I tell it to send pulses. Uh, I don't remember why, but I do. Um, you'll also notice that when I send pulses, I turn the blue LED on and off. Um, these are things I use to recognize the commands of the joystick. Um, when you do upper left, you know, it turns out these joysticks are not linear. When you start to move them, they're more exponential and they go max really fast. So this creates the dead zone and what I call the end zone slot. It makes it work. Um, I honestly don't remember why this is here, but it is. It doesn't mess anything up. So then I go through and the first thing I do is I decide what is the state of the remote. And I've got up, middle, down, left, center, right. So, so if you're just letting go, it's going to be middle's true, center's true, and click is false. Then I get the X and Y coordinates, or Y and X coordinates, from the joystick. Um, then I see if we are within the max for Y, that means we're up. I see if we're within the min for the end slop and the max of Y, or the zero, I, I don't remember. Anyways, yeah, end slop and zero, see if we're down. I do the same thing to see are we in the middle, right, left, center. So that gives me kind of a grid and I know where the joystick's at with the dead space and the slop. And then I go through and see, okay, if we are up and left, that means I want to send volume down. If I'm up and right, volume up. Down left, back, down right, home. Down and center, down, up and center, up, left and middle, right and middle right, up and click, power toggle, click and center and middle, so you're in the middle and you click the button, okay control and then we sleep for 50 milliseconds, and then we do it over again. We can sleep here because at this point anything has been sent, and it doesn't matter if the 38 kilohertz wave has been used or not. Um, just in case you missed it, let me go back and cover the PWM again. PWM is pulse width modification, or modulation, sorry. So the idea is if you have a square wave, and it doesn't just work with spare waves, but usually it's a square wave. Um, it's, there's a duty cycle, and the duty cycle is what percentage of the time is the signal high versus low. Um, and so 
when you have PWM, you have both the duty cycle and you have the frequency. How often are you sending pulses? Um, and so to drive the infrared LED, which needs to be driven at 38 kilohertz, all we do is we change the PWM frequency, which as far as I know, every microchip that supports PWM, you can set the PWM frequency. We set that for 38 kilohertz or 38,000 cycles per second. And then we set the duty cycle at 50%. In this case, we're saying it's a 16-bit integer, so that's 32,000, 50% unsigned integer. Um, so anyways, that's, that drives that, that signal. So what happens is the LED is actually it's flipping on and off 38,000 times a second. And then when we go high for like 9 milliseconds, we're sending tons and tons of pulses. And the infrared receiver looks for something pulsing at 38 kilohertz. When it sees something pulsing at 38 kilohertz, it sends a 1 out. And then when it sees that pulsing at 38 kilohertz stop, it sends a zero out. One, zero, one, zero, one, zero. So the infrared receiver is not actually counting the pulses, it just see, or the, the individual 38 kilohertz pulses, it just sees those and knows, oh, I should be outputting a one right now until that stops. And then it turns on again and it starts and sending out a one. It's not pulsing, it's just sending out a one and that goes away. Um, so that's how the, the PWM works on the 38 kilohertz infrared. So anyways, um, it was a really fun project, learned a ton, learned that the frequency doesn't matter exactly. Uh, my TV worked from like 40 kilohertz to like 36 or something. Um, so anyways, good luck. I hope you have some fun.